Before we get started, we wanted to thank Matchstick Golf for being our first title sponsor. Matchstick is a custom designer of ball markers based in Portland, Oregon, that was born out of its founder getting sick and tired of trying to find cool ball markers that weren't huge, heavy poker chips that didn't cost $300 on eBay. Matchstick's markers include the one-eyed alligator from Happy Gilmore, a stack of cash that will have you putting for dough. Right now, Matchstick is offering 15% off your first order at matchstickgolf.com with the code MUNICIPALS. So head on over to matchstickgolf.com, enter MUNICIPALS at checkout, tell them Big C in Ashton sent you. How hard did you push it? Till I black out? Yes. Numerous times, yes. Get this recorded here. All right. What's happening, Municipals? This is Big Chris. No Ashton today. We've got a special guest, our man, Matty Brown, owner of Manzanita Golf Club. I, I'm not going to get into the history right off the bat because I'm going to let Maddie tell you guys a little bit about it. Maddie, how you doing, my man? Doing great, Chris. It's great to be on, buddy. Love what you're doing. Oh, appreciate it. Yeah, I'm just glad we could finally uh, finally get you on. I disappeared out to Chicago for a while, and I've been planning to get you on for a while, so I'm definitely stoked we finally finally were able to link up and get you get you on. Well, it sounds like you had a dope trip. Can't wait to hear more about it and uh, get you down and play Highlands and Manzanita again real soon. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and the great thing, if anybody hasn't been to Oregon that listens, November is actually a great time to get out to the get out to the coast in Oregon. It sounds really weird because it's super rainy inland for us here. But usually you can get some spectacular days out on the coast in November, December. For sure. So if you guys ever don't don't hesitate to visit the coast of Oregon in November, December and go see Maddie and play play some Highlands and Manzanita out there. But what I want to get into, let's do a little backstory on you. So how did you get started in golf? What led you to the Oregon coast? Um, give us a little backstory on on your hmm. origins in the golf industry. Yeah, so. Um, I grew up right across the street from Gearheart Golf Links, um, right across from the 15th hole. For those of you guys who have played it, 15 is that uh, short part of three. And right across the street is 4th and Cottage. Um, there's actually an old house that's right on the top of 4th and Cottage, which is uh, the guy that built Gearheart Golf Links used to have a house there. So it goes way back to late 1800s. So I grew up right across the street, um, started, you know, being interested in golf and probably I was probably like 11 or 12. Um, my parents didn't belong to the local country club, which is Astoria. Uh, so I played kind of grew up playing Gearheart, um, playing on the beach a lot, just hitting golf balls, making up holes all around town. Um, and I actually started working at the golf course at Gearheart when I was 13. That was my first job. And uh, worked for my mentor, uh, PGA professional named Dan Streit, who uh, back in the early 80s started kind of a mail order golf business, shipping golf clubs all over the country. He was kind of like Edwin Watts before Edwin Watts. And uh, so I learned a whole bunch of cool merchandise stuff from him and just all about golf and, you know, all about the um, ins and outs of the golf business early on. And... Uh, and then he bought the Highlands Golf Course in 1990, 1991, and followed him over there, worked for him in high school a little bit. And when he was set to retire in 2007, um, he sold the golf course, and we took over his uh, pro shop business and started leasing the golf course from the new owners. So that's how we got started at the Highlands. Um, and then in 2018, uh, we had an opportunity to purchase, uh, the Manzanita golf course. So we took over there. Um, but golf's basically been the only thing I know, uh, my only job has ever been really in golf. Um, but I've had a, a cool chance to work at a ton of nice fun golf courses and, 
um, travel around through golf and, um, you know, just work at some really cool spots and meet a lot of cool people. So it's, it's been an awesome journey so far. So from the little bit I know, um, and you know, I got to meet you out in Highlands when I came out and played, played Highlands in Manzanita, you know, a while back, 2016 was a, was a pretty big year for you. So you were merchandiser of the year for the PGA professionals and you took over as the uh, mayor of Gerhardt. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a crazy year. I don't know what I was thinking, uh, but it was awesome. So um, I've been in kind of city uh, volunteer city stuff for a long time. I was on the Gerhardt planning commission for I think six or seven years and uh, was the chairperson on that committee for a long time. And, uh, some folks in town were like, Hey, you should run for mayor. And I'm like, gosh, I don't know, man, that is a lot. we got a lot going on golf course wise and everything else. But I said, Hey, why not? And so, um, we started campaigning in 2016. Um, got the phone call from the president, the PGA, Derek Sprague. He said, Hey Matt, congratulations. You won public merchandiser of the year. Um, and I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And so it was really cool. They flew us out to, um, to New York, which was the hundredth, um, annual PGA meeting was in New York city where the PGA started, where it began. So it was really cool to win that year because we were downtown New York. Um, you know, every, everybody was there. there Jack Nicholas was, was there. He was one of our speakers. Um, you know, it's just really, really cool. And um, it was also election night too. So I was out of town for election night and I was in New York and um, the election night was the night before we were doing the, the presentation for the PGA um, merchandiser award. So I was super nervous because a, I don't want to accept the award and ha have lost the mayor being the mayor, you know, so I hope I win. So super, super nervous. We uh, kind of went out to dinner that night. And at like, I think midnight or so, one of our buddies actually was Sean Fredrickson, um, who, who was a good friend and, and mentor to me. And he, he was out with us and, and John Kawaso and, and some, some other PGA friends. And Sean said, Hey Matt, I just checked, checked the newspaper, local newspaper, you won. And, um, so my little sister lives in New York. So we got to, uh, go to her favorite bar and we were all, you know, taking shots till two in the morning and, uh, having a good time. So it was a really fun year and, um, got to meet a lot of great people, you know, in the PGA and, and a lot of great, um, networking and connections to, um, learn a little bit more about their piece facilities as well. You know, a lot of the, the folks that I met were, you know, pros at public courses as well. And just listening to, you know, how they, our helping grow the game was really, really cool. And it's something that I'll, you know, continue to do. Yeah. I mean, th I think that's one thing I got from you when I met, when I met you was the, your passion to grow the game and to also, you know, really invigorate youth and things like that into, into golf. And that's, you know, something that I have a passion of being a high school golf coach and, you know, being a professional fitter and builder golf clubs, getting kids into the game, getting youth into the game, reinvigorating it in any way you possibly can is something that I definitely have seen, you know, coming from you through being, you know, owning Manzanita and Highlands, and then also, you know, being tied in with pretty much, all the golf courses on the that entire peninsula you know it's it's really been great to see and i mean you with what you've done with king sevy and the logo and what manzanita has been able to do merchandising wise on that side from a small town on the coast of oregon and having seen beanies and shirts through all of our travels. Like I've ran into people wearing Manzanita gear in almost every state I've been in, which is just, it's baffling to me just because the amount of, you know, outreach that you've had has been immense on that side. Well, that's really cool to hear. I mean, um, you know, we were pretty shocked too, when we just started having fun with, 
with our new branding at Manzanita when we took over. Um, you know, the the previous uh, operators they they didn't do too much with merchandise, just a little bit, and um, you know, we wanted to kind of refresh the brand a little bit, make it more fun and hip and cool. And you know, there's just so much energy right now into golf from beginners and and from guys like you and you know people that are making golf less stuffy and more like dude let's just go out and play with a let's have a couple beers and you know wear a hoodie and just have some fun and so that's the kind of vibe we wanted at manzanita you know we got a a big surfer crowd here at the coast so i grew up with a lot of skateboarders and surfers and um that vibe is really really kind of starting to 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 uh you know jump on with golf as well and and i think it's really really cool to see that and so um you know, a good friend of mine, Chad DeWild, who, um, uh, his company Wild and Co, they do logos, um, for a lot of breweries, a lot of beer in Oregon, um, companies. And they did the Seamus logo, Seamus golf logo. And, um, shout out Akbar, shout out Akbar Chisty. What's up? Who, uh, who's sporting a Manzanita shirt today on Instagram. I saw that. I saw that on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. That was sick. Yeah, it's pretty nice. It looks really cool. Um, He's a good model uh, for uh, for our for our gear for sure. Uh, <laughs> he uh, yeah, those but, big guys fit well in those sweaters. But you know, Akbar has been such a great friend, and we we became good friends and golfing buddies. And so we we're always constantly running ideas by each other. And we we got together with with his logo uh, guy Chad, and we uh, I think we were in Portland at uh, Jake's Crawfish. I think is where we met and. Uh, he's like, Hey man, let's, let's have some drinks and sketch some stuff out. And so we just started coming up with ideas and, um, you know, the, the old logo for Manzanita was kind of a couple of seagulls in a wave or something. And, um, I thought, you know, I like the seagull theme, but let's, let's give this, let's make a character out of this guy. And so over the course of like three hours and probably, you know, six drinks, we, uh, we created the legend of King Sevi. And, um, really did a whole backstory about it and everything. And it was really, really fun. And then we just kept going back and forth and, and, um, refining the logo and, um, the branding and stuff. And he's so good. I mean, he's so, so good. And the stuff he's done with, um, some of these beer brands and stuff in Oregon are incredible. You, you've probably seen a lot of his stuff and, and don't even know it. Um, but he kind of specializes in beer and golf. So it's totally the vibe that we're, we're looking for anyway. Um, so we had a lot of fun and we continue to have fun and collaborate on things. And, um, so yeah, we just were like, gosh, let's just start, you know, putting, putting some stuff online and see where it goes. And then pretty soon we've got, you know, golf guys from all over wearing like our original hoodie, you know, that, that was our number one, that was our first thing we put online. It was super fun. And, and, um, people were like, Oh, this is my favorite hoodie. And, and then we just kind of went from there and it, every time we just come up with fun stuff and see where it goes. Yeah. I mean, in, you know, even, you know, bordering on that, you guys did the same thing with Highlands as well. I mean, the upgrade with the logo and with the script and everything that you have on, you know, with the Highlands was j- just as good as what you guys did with King Sevy. Cause I mean, I, I myself am a heart. I love your guys' logo. You guys did out at at, at Highlands, and I think I spent a, probably too much money out there when I when I was visiting you. So, you know what? What it was it the same person that you had do King Sevy do Highlands as well? Yeah, when when King Sevy kind of took off, and um and and just seeing other courses and and stuff that that kind of have done this like rebranding and just coming up with a cool fun vibe and look um you know the, the sugar loaf guys do this kind of stuff all the time and you know they just came out with a super dope logo for um for the hay course uh you know they're at pebble beach and actually they they came out with that logo a couple of weeks after we, we came out with sir eldrick but you know that type of thing is so cool and so um, we were looking to refresh the the logo there and, you know, we were thinking of something Scottish Highlands and I was kind of thinking maybe some kind of lion or something. And then Akbar actually goes, dude, why don't you do an elk since you've got 150 head of elk out there that trample your greens? Like, 
twice a week. Why, why aren't you going to do an elk? And I was like, Oh my God, what a brilliant idea. Akbar shout out. Um, I was like, that's perfect because you kind of have to embrace those elk out there. And so same kind of thing. We just, we kind of created a, a fun legend and story about Sir Eldrick, the pin slayer, who is, uh, who is that rascally elk that that's always dancing on the greens and he's breaking pins and stealing, you know, people's balls and stuff. And, um, so we had our, our same friend, Chad, um, come up with something. And that was really, that was actually even more fun and involved than, uh, King Sebi because, like we didn't know what direction to go in and i was kind of thinking no we need a kind of a game of thrones vibe here with this guy but he can't be like too you know serious he's got to be kind of fun too so let you know let's have him stick his tongue out you know and let's have him break a pin or something so we just went back and forth for like a month and then uh came up with sir eldrick um who's been real popular as well and um definitely kind of refreshed the, the branding there as well yeah so if you guys it for all our listeners it if you are going out to bandon or if you're going to be coming to oregon at all to play golf you have to i mean it's a mandatory thing to play highlands manzanita and if you have time play gerhardt because i'm we'll both tell you it's a great great track to go out and play unbelievable Um, and then make your way down the coast because I don't think a lot of people outside of Oregon realize how good golf is on the coast of Oregon outside of Bandon. So, you know, you've got your spectacular courses we have down there, but I mean, you've got Coos, you've got Florence, you've got Agate. I mean, it's, it's insane the amount of courses that we have along the coast and I'm missing probably two thirds of them. Well, I mean, we should write a book about all the cool nine hole courses and, and I got to tell you, when we have time here later on, we, we got to talk about this 12 hole course I played on the coast a couple of weeks ago as well, which is the dopest thing I've ever seen. But, um, but I'd even put, you know, when you go into the Gearheart area, you've got cool nine hole courses. You've got, you know, uh, you've got the Highlands and then you've got, uh, the seaside golf course. Okay. The seaside golf course was built in 1921 by Chandler Egan, who, we all know about Chandler Egan used to work for McKenzie yes. helped with Pebble beach. That list goes on and on. He laid that course out and it is, they, I think they irrigate the greens only in the tees. And so you get a lot of roll in the summertime. Um, it floods a little bit in the winter, but it's a really, really fun course. So I'd argue like if you're going, if you're going down to band and you come in to the coast, spend a couple of days, play Astoria country club, which is you know, you'll see pictures of, you know, people have seen pictures online probably that haven't made it out this way, but it is an extremely unique link style golf course. Will you guys- Astoria allow the public out there? Do you, do you have to get an invite from your club? What, what's the, the only time I've ever played it was I had an invite from an actual member out there. Yeah, it is private. So you could play with a member or if you're a member somewhere, they do do reciprocals as well. Um, and, and if somebody is in town and I'm a member out there, so if anyone's in town and wants to, wants to play, let me know. Cause I've always loved taking people out there. I took Tron out there a couple of weeks ago, or sorry, a couple of years ago. And then we played again this last year when he came into town with, with the boys and, um, he took some great drone footage, um, of, uh, of the pipeline, the, the kind of pipe holes where you're just going straight down the dunes. It's really cool. Um, yeah. It, so, if anybody wants to see that, check out their their tour yeah. sauce organ because it's in there. And Maddie <laughs> as well is in that tour sauce episode. Yeah, hit me up if you guys ever want to play out there. Um, it's it's probably my favorite day to day golf course. Um, if I were to say, hey, if you could only play one course every day, it'd probably be that one. And in, in St Andrews would probably be my two. And um, you know, Astoria is so cool because depending on the weather, it changes every day. Gearheart's like that too. I mean, Gearheart's one of my favorite court 18 hole courses as well. Um, but yeah, there's so much great golf up this way. Then you go down the coast, there's Manzanita. And then, like you said, there's all those hidden gems all the way down the coast. I mean, you've almost got this, um, you know, you could play like four or five, nine hole courses before you even get to Bandit. Um, you know, you've got like the stuck, uh, the Nesquen area, um, 
you know, there's like Agat Beach. There's, I mean, there's, I, I can't even count how many there are. Um, but this whole, <laughs> but the, let me say one thing. When you're going down towards the Coos Bay area, uh, there's a course out, out in Charleston, which is called Sunset Bay. And it's 12 holes. And it's really cool. And it was laid out by one of the guys that laid out Spyglass. Really? Yeah. And we rolled up there and I don't know, some people might've followed my Instagram story when I was in Bandon a few weeks ago, but I took some cool pictures of that place and I'll put, I'll post them up again for you guys um, and send them over to Chris. But uh, dude, it's so cool. I mean, it was just like 330 yard par fours, um, you know, dog leg, right, left, um, you know, just really cool really cool stuff and that's that's built right on the peninsula right above coos correct kind of yeah so if you go out like to to the coast from coos directly across yeah but above basically um you can get to like these little coves right on the ocean where there's i mean just spectacular scenery and this course is like there's like a um uh almost like a a mountain between the ocean and this course. So you can't see the ocean from this course because it's kind of down in a little valley. Um, But you can feel it. I mean, you know, the ocean's like right there. And um, uh, yeah, it was really cool. I mean, there's a little, you know, tiny little golf shop. There was in the golf shop, there was uh, a little TV with like old VHS tapes. And, and I was like, dude, this is so cool. And then there was like a pool table in there that looked like it hadn't been used for a while. And, and I, we went in there and I was like, dude, what VHS tapes do you guys have? And they had like Jurassic Park and the Matrix. And I was but like, that's, dude, this is so That's dope. so Oregon. That's so Oregon. Because Oregon just doesn't ever adjust or change to the times. It nope. feels like the entire state is 10 to 15 years behind the rest of <laughs> the country. Sure. And so you coming across that, it's just like, that actually sounds like a North Highland, or I mean, North Highlands, uh, a Northwood on the coast. For sure. That it, it he nailed it. It's yeah, because uh, that's how you feel when you drive out to Northwood. It's just, it has never changed. It is exactly like it was when it was built. They don't want to change it. It's not going to ever change. It's just what it is. And there's something like super cool about that. Like uh, when I went and played it, I was like, oh my God, this has to be on, you know, like the the Sugarloaf Hidden Gems list. Um, so I like message those guys. I was like, dude, you guys got to get out here next time you're in town and play this place is so cool. And the vibe is so cool. And they even have it. They have, they have the golf course dog, which when I grew up working at Gearheart golf links, um, and back then when I, when I worked there in the, you know, early nineties, um, when I was in high school and stuff, it was like, uh, it, it was way back too. I mean, the, the old pro shop was like old seventies and everything was seventies, but they had a golf course dog named Billy and Billy would roll out of the sand trap. The sand trap was the local bar and Billy would just chill there. And like, he didn't have an owner. He was just the golf course dog. Like, Sometimes he'd sleep outside. Sometimes he'd sleep in the cart barn. Like, but you'd always see Billy, the golf course dog. And this place had a golf course dog that looked just like Billy, like just an old mangy dog that just sat outside and everyone loved him. I thought that was so cool. <laughs> it, I There's something about like golf course dogs or superintendent dogs that just make you feel at home on a golf course. You just feel like it's a, it's a family environment and everybody is welcome. And that's exactly. one thing I think we talk about with like a lot of the, the public courses out here in Portland is we, we really think that people should be allowed to bring their dogs on the course. I, I think sure. it should be completely acceptable. It's, sh- you know, courses should be treated more like a park, more like a place you could take your family, especially with the publicly owned courses that are ran by municipals. Like, it's one of those things I think we fight all the time and we've got buddies in the Bay area that just bring their dogs anyway and ask for forgiveness later kind of thing. Yeah. I think that's the way to go. Um, so, you know, one of the, 
one of the experiences that really changed my view of what golf is because we have a in in america we have a filter of what people think golf should be right so we kind of grew up with you know you got to wear a collared shirt and you got to go to the clubhouse and take your hat off. And, and, and we love it. And there, there's something cool about those traditions of golf. I mean, we do respect those and everything else, but you know, my best friend and I, when we were kind of traveling around, figuring out what we were doing with, with golf and stuff, we, we went to Scotland and we, we lived in St. Andrews for a summer. Um, and we just rented a, a little flat and caddied a little bit at, at a course nearby. And just, we, all we did was play, the old course and the other courses there like every day we do like 36 holes a day uh, caddy a couple times a week to, p- to pay rent but we were basically just golf bums like sur- like a surf trip you know like a surf bum trip where you're just surfing every day so we did we did that with golf one summer and everyone was bringing their dogs out and then all of a sudden you know the old course was closed on sundays and it was a park it was a public park so everyone's out there with their dogs they're doing frisbee they're they're playing soccer football um, they're doing all that. And that really inspired me when I got home. And so one of the things that we've done at Manzanita is we close the course on Mondays in the off season. So we just started closing the course on Mondays and we turn it into a public park. So everyone can come out, walk their dogs, everything else. In fact, over the last couple of years, people have started to have like picnics in the number one fairway and stuff. And, it, it kind of helps with the maintenance people too, with our maintenance crew, because they, they're able to use Mondays as kind of a project day. Like if they wanted to redo a bunker or, you know, do some irrigation projects and stuff, but you still see the whole community coming around and they're all walking their dogs or having fun. And they've been so cool and nice. And they're like, Hey, you know, we'll make sure we don't walk on the greens and we'll clean up after our dogs. And, um, you know, they'll come up to me and they'll be like, God, thank you so much for letting us do this. This is so cool. And I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, I think it's, I think what's, it's what's golf, golf's all about. You have to, you know, you have to make it community accessible and you have to be part of the community. And so that's been really, really cool out there. We've had a really cool reception when we started doing that. That's huge because I'm, I don't know how many episodes we've actually brought that up about how, some of these courses especially it's great to see a privately owned course even though it's publicly accessible do that because you know that in in the slow times out by you guys it it does get a little snail pace at this time of time of the year and so it is a little bit easier to do where in, in the city even when it rains they're still getting a decent amount of play and things like that but I just think we would be able to get more funds and we would be able to create more renovations on these courses, especially owned by the city and things like that. If people were able to access it outside of the golf, because like you were just saying, I think people look at golf and they look at it as a snooty, you know, sport that's only accessible to a small amount of people where we're trying to make it seem like everybody is accessible to the game. There's no reason that every single person shouldn't be access or have access to the, to the game. And if you're not, maybe you can use the the course as a park or a walking trail or whatever you'd like it to be. And I think for like East Moreland and Rose city and a lot of these courses out here in Portland, I think we would have less of a fight when it comes down to asking for a larger budget, if they would open it up and allow that, you know, when the course shuts down at night, why not turn it into a movie theater and have one of those blow up, you know, screens with a projector and allow the community to come out there and have movie nights. I mean, there's a million things that they could utilize the facilities for that. I just feel like is so lacking across the United States because we have had this unaccessible feeling to the game for so long. Absolutely. That's such a great point. And when you strip away all the bullshit, right? Like when you go play, when, when, when you play golf in Scotland and, and you're playing, you know, St. Andrews, which is 500 years old or whatever, like those people aren't pretentious at all. I mean, they're, they're out there with their dogs. They're having fun. Um, 
you, you kind of strip away all the, the whatever, and then it just becomes the game. You know, it's just, hey, you've got a ball and a stick, and you go and find it, and you're there with your friends and your family and your dog and your pets and everything, and every, everybody's fine. Um, and, you know, I think there's a movement to kind of get a little more back to that. And, you know, your point with the with the city courses in Portland, and I, I have a couple friends that are involved and have been involved in managing some of those properties and and you know we talked with some folks over to east Mormon the other day too and you know i know that they've gotten some negative attention from some some of the folks that are saying hey well we don't need this for golf we we could do this with it and i think they're missing the point of how important golf is to a community and how how open space is so important to the community um whether it's golf or, or a park or anything else and like you said those golf courses could be utilized um at certain times or certain days of the week where there are more things you can do than just golf. Uh, the walking trails are great. You know, we have at Manzanita, we've got kind of some cool wilderness areas where people can walk around even when plays there and they're not going to interrupt play. Um, but you know, I've got a friend we we're talking about, Hey, can we put some Frisbee golf stuff out on a few holes? Um, some disc golf and stuff. And I was like, yeah, I think there's certain times of the day or afternoon where you could do some stuff like that. You could put foot golf in. I love your idea about watching them doing an outdoor movie. I mean, why not bring, you know, why not do a little drive-in movie, um, action? Uh, that's awesome. Um, you know, so there's so many things that are important about the open space and about the golf. And I think part of our jobs, you know, all of us that are in the golf industry is probably to educate folks on that stuff. You know, I'd love to, talk to some of the, the officials in Portland and kind of, you know, show them examples of like why, why this golf course is so important as a golf course, but what, why that is, you know, why is that so important? Why, why is being outside so important and, and doing activities outside? I mean, we all know that, but you know, during the pandemic, I think when, when we've seen so many more people need to get outside and they started taking up golf and now all of a sudden you've got this whole new, group that um i can't i can't tell you how many times somebody's come up to me in the last year and a half and they're like my god i stopped playing golf 10 years ago and i don't know why i stopped playing golf and i got back into it and i realized like how great it is uh, and stuff and i'm like yeah well it's pretty amazing it's a pretty amazing sport and and just the fact that you're outside now and you're getting ex exercise more and you're around around your friends and community is is really special so that's definitely been a positive out of, you know, the last couple of years. Yeah. I think that it's funny. Cause I, I've been playing since I was nine years old. I'm in my mid thirties now. And you know, all of my friends that, that used to make fun. So I was in a metal band in high school and I, I played on the football team. And, and so I did not look like your atypical golfer. I had hair down to my mid back you know, my hair looked like Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin. <laughs> it, it just like, you know, at, and I was captain of the golf team all through high school. And then, you know, after high school, I continued to play. And all of my buddies that I was really close with that I played football or I was in the band with things like that, they, it's, they would always, uh, you know, give me shit for being on the golf team because I'd show up to school in my polo and tucked in with my, with my golf pants and, you know, my pullover V neck sweater and all this, you know, because we had an old school coach that was very strict on, on your regiment, what you wore sure. and things like that. And it's just, they would give me shit every time. And those guys in the last two years, all have picked up the game and they're contacting me on what clubs to buy and, you know, how, how they should approach practicing and, you know, just getting involved. And it's really interesting because now they're understanding what I've been talking about for so long and how it's, you're basically going on a hike in a beautiful environment and playing a fun game while you're doing it. And, and they're, they're catching it. They're, they're, they're understanding and feeling it. And, <laughs> and now they're, they're, you know, really got the the bug and have have gotten into it. And it's incredible to see because I think with breaking down the walls of having to wear a polo and, you know, sweatshirts kind of becoming more of a, a standard when you go out and play and people not really caring if you wear jeans, as long as you're not, you know, going out there half naked and, you know, right. 
looking looking a fool nobody gives a shit anymore you know and again we we as golfers that have been doing this for a while we still love the the courses that have the tradition like i don't mind putting on my my monkey suit and you know going yeah. out in a really nice outfit and going to play some of these nicer courses but my regular course that i play all the time I like to be able to show up in a t-shirt or a sweatshirt and go out and just play 18 really fast in three and a half hour morning round. And there should be nothing wrong with it at all. And I think that change. And I think with you guys creating merchandise in your, in your shops that has that kind of vibe to it, where I walk in and I see more hoodies, shirts, beanies, and, snapback hats in your guys's pro shops and i see polos and i think when people walk in and see that they're like oh this is accepting where if you walk into pumpkin there's no hatred on pumpkin at all we all love playing pumpkin ridge but you walk into their clubhouses and it just doesn't give you a vibe of welcomeness because it's your atypical clubhouse or pro shop that's just got your Nike and Adidas polos and it's just everything is is to cue of what you anticipate a golf course is is offering and it's great to see you guys and a lot of courses kind of jump on that board where golf is a casual game it doesn't need to be snooty and up you know uptight for sure and I think one of the coolest trends that I've seen is um now you'll go into these top you know club pro shops like I had um the opportunity to go down and play uh, Cyprus a couple, uh, a couple months ago this summer. And then a couple years ago, we got to go into Pine Valley. And the things that my buddies and I were buying were they had a great t-shirt selection. You know, they started to have some sweatshirts and hoodies. And I was like, oh, wait, this is super cool. Like, it's starting to filtrate into these guys, too, because they realize that all the members, like, if they're just, you know, playing, hanging out at home and stuff, they're going to want to wear a t-shirt or a hoodie and stuff. And so, you know, when I wouldn't, you know, anytime you get to play one of those type of courses, it's so special and everything. And, you know, and that's your chance to work where you have to wear your jacket in the, in the dining room and stuff, you know, that's your one chance to, to, to do that kind of, that kind of stuff. But, um, but when I, when I was buying gifts for friends, you know, when you go to a place like that, you want to just hook all your friends up and stuff. And, and all of them got like cool Pine Valley t-shirts and, and some of the belts and stuff. and, and sweatshirts and things like that too. And, uh, and they love that stuff. I mean, that's so cool. Um, and so, you know, at Highlands, um, we, we, you know, we have our, we do a lot with Nike. So we've got a lot of like Nike pullovers and, and vests and that kind of thing. And and we do a lot with foot choice. So we carry, you know, a few of those type of things, but you're right. Like when you walk in there, I mean, the number one thing people are asking for is like, Hey dude, I want to get one of those hoodies. Do you have a hoodie in size, you know, whatever. Um, and the t-shirts have been really popular for us, long sleeve t-shirts, um, you know, as the weather gets a little chillier, uh, beanies, you know, the trucker caps are super popular. Um, you know, it's just kind of going with what's going on and, and also what your clientele is as well. I mean, we, we, we have people that don't want to spend, you know, a hundred dollars on a, on a polo, you know, they, they want to spend a, you know, 40 bucks on a hoodie or, or whatever and have a souvenir and um and that makes total sense um you know i mean some of the some of the golf fashion stuff has gotten really really expensive lately so it's it's tough to get a logo on your favorite course sometimes no absolutely and i know a lot of people that haven't ever played manzanita or highlands but have driven through both towns and will just stop in and buy merch from you guys and I think that's a huge market that I don't think a lot of golf courses have tapped into. And we talk all the time, and I'm, I know you've talked with Ryan out at Wildwood, how that's kind of been a change for him and really kind of jumping on that. And he saw what you guys did at Manzanita and Highlands. He'll be the first one to admit that he for sure got you know inspiration from you guys to kind of follow along those trends. Well, it, that's been so cool to see, like what Ryan's doing at Wildwood. And we we chatted a little bit. We messaged each other a little bit. Yet yeah, last night we're going to get together, and um, I'd love to do some collaborations with him. He's just he's so smart, and he's just killing it with the social media. And he's killing it with with some of the um, the 
uh, the products that he's coming up with. I mean, just they're so cool. And I just saw those putter covers that he came out with. Um, I had to, I had to get one for myself. Did you? Which one did you go with? So I did went you, with the brown, the brown Yeti. Nice, the Chewbacca, the Chewy. Yeah. Yeah. I had to go with Chewy. It was too good. Like I, I love the Abominable Snowman. Like it was fantastic. But I know myself, and I'm gonna ruin a white head cover like three rounds sure. in. Yeah. So the, I mean, it was so Chewy was just. I mean, well, you're a mountain guy too. Yeah. No. Gotta... So not anymore. Oh. Okay. Back back to a squareback. So not not oh. playing the mallet anymore. Cool. Squareback's got a little bit of meat behind it. That's good. Yeah, wanted wanted something people. exactly. Yeah, wanted something with a with an L neck on it, but nice. still wanted to have that meaty back on there. So it was kind of a perfect compromise. And perfect. Me being club fitter, tweaking and changing my equipment out is like changing my underwear. So, but that's cool. That's fun. Yeah, it, it's enjoyable. But yeah, what what I've seen with you guys and what Ryan's Mm. doing and a lot of, you know, a lot of the guys across, you know, we talk with, you know, the guys at Sweetens Cove as well. And they're kind of in the same boat you guys are where, I mean, they're killing it when it comes to the merch side of things. And again, the same vibe you're getting out at Sweetens, you're going to get out at Manzanita. Sweetens has been such an inspiration because, um, you know, the nine hole vibe is so cool right now. And, you know, people don't have necessarily five hours to play. Um, everyone's got a super busy schedule. So, you know, these courses that you can play in two hours or less, um, and then to have a world class, I mean, you saw what they did with that property from what it was. I mean, are you kidding me? Like, uh, you know, and in what they still plane, do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those guys are geniuses and, um, and I haven't been there yet. And I'm, that's like my number one trip that I, I want to do next with, with, with some of our buddies is just go there and, you know, Akbar and I and our friend Alex and stuff, we've been wanting to get a trip over there for a while. And, um, and I hope to go over there soon, but I just love what they're doing. Um, you know, using the e-commerce, uh, a lot, you know, a lot of us are on Shopify, which, which is a really easy, you know, way to, to transition to e-commerce stuff. We use that for, for both of our websites. And I think the Sweden guys use that too. And I, uh, you know, I, I, I try to borrow a lot of ideas from those guys too. I mean, the way that they, they have their little, you know, pro shop and, um, that cool outdoor area that they have now and the, and the punch bowl putting green. Um, you know, I know Akbar and those guys are really interested in getting some more punch bowls built around the city. And, um, uh, and I, I like that idea a lot. I like I like that community getting people together uh, putting. I, I like I almost like that better than like even the, you know like the top golf stuff. I think it's almost more important to have people in that punch bowl type setting. Not that top golf is is you know not not a good idea, but um, it seems like that brings more people in. It brings a lot of kids in as well. So yeah, so Chehalem Jeh- Glen out here in Portland. <laughs> actually just created a a putting course out out right next to the ninth hole or i'm sorry the 10th hole uh on the back dine and it's just left of the driving range in between their practice putting green on your way out to the 10 and my wife absolutely loves it she's not a golfer at all i got her a left-handed putter because she's left-handed and she will go out there and spend hours with me. And like you were just saying, I think if we could get a lot of these courses to build similar to what Bandon has with like a punch bowl green, that's got a little bar on it to where family and friends can just go out, hang, you know, hang out. And if you've ever played mini golf, it's a better version of mini golf. In my opinion, it's just, super fun you can have 10 to 30 holes on on one of those punch bowl greens and and just have a blast for hours and you don't need to charge anybody for it because you're gonna make more money on drinks and food sales if you do it correctly than you would ever have to charge anybody to to come out there and then it's also bring people out to a facility that they might not have ever come out to at any other time in 10 20 percent of those people might pick up the game and then we've added more people that loves golf so 
I'm all for Akbar getting as many punch bowls as he absolutely can out here in, in Portland. I would love to see it.